So I'll begin this way and say that I've uh, so I've been covering uh, waterfront revitalization for a long time, and I realized when the sidewalk proposal came forward that I've spent almost half my career writing about it, going back to the final report, which some of you will remember and some of you won't. But it, it uh, this was a sort of a big framing study that came out of uh, you know years of inaction and mistakes on the waterfront. Uh, and produced ultimately uh, Waterfront Toronto, which was initially known as the Toronto Waterfront Revitalization uh, uh, Corporation, um, and which sort of worked for many years uh, using a very conventional development uh, and redevelopment model that uh, was advocated by its, uh, by its by some of the people who were uh, there at the birth, uh, Tony Coombs, uh, Joe Barrage, um, Robert Fung, of course. And this is uh, basically a model that involves, uh, you know, cleaning up contaminated land, uh, investing in the public realm as a way of attracting development and investment, um, and uh, you know, sort of bringing back brownfield sites in that way. Uh, Waterfront Toronto, for many years, uh, was very well known for uh, its commitment to public consultation, um, and in fact, when during the Ford administration. Uh, the, uh, the brothers Ford were given their first big um, uh, defeat when they tried to kind of gerrymander um, and sort of undermine uh, an important uh, uh, major plan for the waterfront. Um, and it was through the, the strength of the public consultation, the extensive involvement of Torontonians in, you know, in, in this conversation about what the waterfront should look like that uh, they, they were told in no uncertain terms, and this led to a unanimous decision at council, that uh, that uh, the plan to revitalize the, the, the dawn and uh, reconfigure uh, some of the areas in the Portland uh, should go forward and shouldn't be changed. So that's where we got to. So last year, um, after uh, you know many years of trying to get the plans aligned, uh, the federal government, the provincial government, and the city agreed on this $1.25 million contribution to rebuilding the, the mouth of the dawn. And this is uh, really, uh, the importance of this project cannot be uh, overstated. It, we don't rebuild the mouths of rivers very often. Uh, this is a very troubled mouth of a river. It's forced to go uh, make a sharp right turn, which rivers apparently don't like to do. Uh, we're going to create this floodplain and this, uh, this new island, Villiers Island. And the uh, the landscape architect who was responsible for this, Michael Van Valkenburg, is a very accomplished and uh, creative person who, you know, who devised with local partners an extraordinary plan for the uh, for uh, for uh, that area. Uh, eventually, uh, resources were identified through infrastructure programs at the federal and provincial level, and this money came forward. And this is a game changer because it begins this process of re configuring and naturalizing the mouth of the dawn, but it basically puts uh, many big development corporations around the world on notice that, uh, the, that the port lands, uh, which is not the map that you saw here, is uh, going to be open for business and going to be ready for development at some point in the, in the foreseeable future, five to seven years. Uh, parenthetically, the deputy city manager, John Libby, and I sort of have this running joke that we both want to be alive when this project is finished. Um, and uh, it looks like that actually is going to happen. So um, so, uh, so this is a really important moment because it, as I said, because it's a commercial signal as, uh, uh, along with many other things. So Waterfront Toronto went through regime change. There's a new, uh, there's a new CEO uh, who came, uh, stepped into office, uh, was stepped into the CEO's position a couple years ago. Um, and as Christina articulated, decided to take a different approach. And the approach was articulated through an RFP that was put on the street about, uh, was, was it May or March of last year? March. Uh, March. March. And the, um, uh, this was a complicated RFP because it was quite different than previous RFPs, which were talking about piece parcels of land. This had, you know, sort of, it was more amorphous. It was, it was basically, uh, the winners would have an opportunity to negotiate as opposed to an opportunity to develop. Uh, and there was an ambiguity in the RFP about what we were talking about. And this is really important, and it's actually a topic of conversation at City Hall right at, as we speak. Mm -hmm. So the question was, are we talking about case 
Keyside, which is a 12.5 acre parcel, sorry, 12.4 acre parcel, which is not that big really. I mean, you could put it on this part of the campus and have plenty of room to spare. Or where we talk about Keyside plus the Portlands, which is 800 acres. Now, uh, so in my experience as a journalist, people don't understand two things, numbers with more than seven digits <laughs> and, uh, and um, uh, space uh, measures. So the Portlands, if you want to understand what the Portlands would look like if you dropped it in the middle of downtown Toronto, it would go from Jarvis to Bathurst and from the, the waterfront up to Queen Street. It's a very large piece of land. It's going to take a century to develop. It's very polluted. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, it's a big domain. It was very much featured as part of the RFP, and it was very much a feature of Sidewalk uh, Labs' uh, proposal to Waterfront Toronto. Um, and so uh, I have a colleague at a different university who's, who put it this way, that they answered a question that wasn't on the exam, uh, <laughs> which is, and, and the initial discussion when uh, Sidewalk Labs came forward was looking at not just at this small parcel, but looking at this larger domain. And why are we looking at the larger domain? Because that larger domain is now in play. Um, and uh, when, I, when I read through the vision document, which is 160, 170 pages long, it's full of ideas, some of which will be implemented and some not, uh, that, uh, that speak to a very large canvas, a very large geographical canvas, a much larger canvas than Keyside. So Keyside, um, uh, is, as I said, not a big space. It, on its own, will not make any uh, difference in uh, overall cost of living in the city of Toronto, in uh, transportation patterns in the city of Toronto. It's, it's a development of some substance, but not an enormous amount of, uh, it's not, it's smaller than the, uh, than the uh, Great Gulf site where the uh, League of Brothers is. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, Good piece of land, but it's it's not a it's not a game-changing space. If you include the Portlands, then we're talking about a very large uh, piece of geography. And if one um, entity um, says this is the vision we're going to have for it, and we're kind of locked in, um, uh, that's a completely different conversation. And to my mind, the conversation that Sidewalk Labs proposed when it came forward with its pitch last. Um, October is talking about that bigger space. So what's going on at City Hall today? So uh, this, uh, the uh, aforementioned deputy uh, deputy city manager put his name on top of a report, on a report, talking which addresses uh, the sidewalk labs and waterfront Toronto proposal. Um, to my reading, it stated in no uncertain terms that what. Uh, we're first going to be talking about is this space and not the Portland. And the reason is, um, the reason that the city sort of kind of drew that line in the sand is because it has a different vision for what the Portlands um, is. It's a very, it's a vision that's been developed over many years of consultation. It's got a lot of um, interest from the film and media community. And my own interpretation, and I'm not in any of those rooms, is that the city's view is uh, bird in hand, and um, that the bird is the film and media uh, uh, industry, which wants to with big footprint buildings kind of closer, sort of away from Villiers Island and closer to the uh, uh, closer to the highway that goes through there. Um, so, uh, so we're back to kind of talking about Keyside, and um, and this is the process that we're going to go through over the next year um, or year less three months, however long we've been at this now. And I've written quite critically about this, this whole process. Um, and uh, I always hear from uh, Sidewalk Labs uh, PR <laughs> person literally an hour after my stories go online. So they're very attentive. Um, they are always very assertive about what they want changed. Um, the, uh, uh, and the, so suggesting to me that there, you know, there are lots of, there's a high, there are lots of things at stake. When I've written critically, I've had an unusually high number of uh, requests for background conversations with people whose names you would recognize. And that to me is interesting. It's not that my writing is brilliant, but it says to me that a lot of people sort of took notice of this and had concerns. And these concerns are going to be discussed and get a 
Foley area. Uh, I'm going to just share with you before I shut up and let my other panelists talk a couple of the concerns that I have from a procedural point of view. If the city was letting a contract for waste management um, to you know, collect garbage in the east side of the city, and one of the proponents said, hey, I'm going to build you a bunch of stuff. Um, this would never go anywhere with the city's procurement policies. This would be ruled offside from the moment it came out of the proponent's mouth, because uh, we don't procure in that way. The city of Toronto had a big procurement problem several years ago, um, has very strict procurement rules. And so my critique of the $50 million, the up to $50 million US that's going to be invested um, is that um, it's, to me, it looks like sort of a loss leader, a down payment in anticipation of a yes from what the Waterfront Toronto Board. Um, and I think it's very difficult for the Waterfront Toronto Board to say no after $50 million has been spent. The second point, um, and I've written about this, and you know, Waterfront Toronto has, has responded in a very positive way about this, is what is the disclosure going to look like around that $50 million? Uh, you know, if I want to be very cynical, I could say that that will buy you a lot of friends in the city. Um, and uh, so I think that it's important that everybody know what the $50 million is going to be spent on, and that the, it's, it's spent in a way that's consistent with the priorities that the city has established for the waterfront area. And I'll just name one of those, and that's, that's transit in the eastern waterfront area. At the moment, the city is, you know, the city council in all its wisdom wants to spend an enormous amount of money on the subway, tunnel, one stop, uh, but there really isn't very much money yet allocated for uh, LRTs along the uh, East Bayfront, or uh, along uh, Queensky East. So if there's a big, if there's a, a down payment on, um, you know, infrastructure and pilot projects, I would hope that it would be consistent with, uh, with established goals and policies. Um, and then the final thing that I'll point out, and, and this is something that I wrote about in my first column, is, is the question of affordability. Uh, so when I, read the, uh, when I read the initial visioning document, I felt very aware of um, the input of, uh, of voices that really understood what was sort of top of mind in the city. And affordability, of course, is an easy thing, right? It's a gimme. Uh, and the question that's less evident to me is how affordability will be executed. So Waterfront Toronto has done an amazing job with providing affordable housing through its development projects, through partnerships with TCHC and so on. Um, but when you're building market units, um, there's going to be a capital cost, and then those market, those units are going to go on sale. So how do we, so the initial sellers will get a low priced unit, but then it goes up to market value. And so I'm not sure how the ball of affordability has moved down the field. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. Um, these are some questions I've put out, and I'm hoping that it can generate some discussion. All right. Thank you very much.